38. Yeah. Now that's going forward. The Cybersecurity Act, right from the onset, establishes its mandate. What the authority is expected to do. One, to regulate. Two, to promote. Mm. Three, to develop cybersecurity activities in the country. That's where we are. And I thought this premise was quite important because Prof was talking about the fact that that technology is in its infancy. And so we must be careful that we don't over-regulate. We will not get the opportunity to even develop the technology in the first place. Understanding its mandate quite well from the first step, the Cybersecurity Authority has four major focus. Mm. And the pillars of the Cybersecurity Authority is one, government. So to understand that government institutions and all the para public agencies understand where we are as a country. Two is public. Three is children. Four, businesses, mm -hmm. to ensure that these four major pillars are secure within Ghana cyberspace. For those of us who have been following very much the activities of the Cybersecurity Authority, 2023 was a major regulatory um, year for the Cybersecurity Authority, where we began the sensitization on um, the establishments, cybersecurity professionals, and our regulatory activities that is supposed to guide the operations of these sectors. Mm. That law came into force this year. So what that means is for cybersecurity professionals, for cybersecurity establishment, and for cybersecurity professionals, it's key that you are licensed, you are accredited before you operate in the nation. Why this? Because we operate within a global community. The cyberspace is not like a physical space where you can easily man your borders. And that's why international cooperation is key within the cyberspace. So it's not that easy for Ghana to say that, look, US or UK has passed this law. We are not going to do it. Now, it doesn't also mean that we have lost our sovereignty. But then we scan the cyberspace to determine that we are rife for this. Between 2018, 2017, 2018, 2019, if we look at Ghana's cybersecurity readiness, we were just within 36, 37 yeah. percent. But in 2021, the international telecommunications ruled Ghana's cybersecurity readiness. We were measured around 86 percent. So between then and now, we just know that there are a lot of cybersecurity activities in the country. Yeah. And ours is to ensure that the cybersecurity professional, the establishment, and all the necessary operators are made ready for what is happening within the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. One of the major areas the cybersecurity authority is doing is to ensure that we are as present in the community as much as possible. And that is capacity building and awareness creation. From 2018 up until now, the cybersecurity has been at major grassroots. Mm. This year, as part of what we are doing, is to ensure that we touch every region. The notion is to let people understand that, yes, Internet of Things is available. AI is very close to our doorstep. These are the opportunities, but these are also threats. Yes. It's like giving a gun to a child and not telling the child what to do with the gun. Mm. Now, the yes. child is going to kill himself. Yes. So really, we've got a mandate to discharge. But from where we are, we think that it's first things first. If we look at you know, technology or you know, uh, technology developers like OpenAI and a lot of the mm. complex you know, innovations that are going on, from where we sit, we are not able to regulate the activities in the first place. So let's look at what we can do with our people. As we speak, okay. Ghana does not have any policy on AI guidelines. That we don't have. And what we must be aware is that the EU just passed theirs last year, mm. November 2023. So yes, 
We are in a hurry as a country, but we also have to be mindful that we tread and tread cautiously. And tread cautiously. That brings me in uh, Maxwell, at uh, least from data protection. So Maxwell will handle two things for me. First of all, in terms of data collection, uh, what is the data protection actually doing to protect consumers when it comes to data uh, collection? And uh, the second one, I think when I was reading your, your, your the ethical, yes, the ethical framework of AI. So, yes, Maxwell. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you, Alma. Um, so, I'll pick it from um, the data protection, what we do, and um, I'll fast forward to the next one. That is the ethical use strategy and the AI strategy, and also give a, where the country is and where we want to achieve from this. Okay, so thank you. Uh, data protection from here. So from the, our act is the 843 2012. That was when the act came in place. So our function is actually to keep and maintain data protection register and also implement and monitor compliance of the act and also investigate any complaints that is from data subject and citizenry. citizenry. So um, what from our act, we always... Um, if we do a lot of awareness, as uh, we work in collaboration with cybersecurity, there's a lot of awareness trainings that we do in regional level, from the tertiary right down to the junior secondary. We do that, and every year we have the data protection week, uh, which we invite all our data controllers, data processors, and data subjects um, to come and celebrate with us. Hello. Okay. So, can I continue? Okay. So, um, as I was saying, um, we encourage that is data. When I say a data controller, well, I say companies who collect information. So, it's right down from whether if you are a um, hospital, bank, any business that you are doing that you are collecting information, you have to be registered under the data protection register. And we are currently working with the Bank of Ghana uh, as a peer regulator, the PPA, to make sure that companies that come in over there to register with them have to make sure that they are compliant with the data protection or they are fully in compliance with the Data Protection Act. Currently, there's no financial institution that I can say that then the Bank of Ghana is really doing well. That all the fintech companies, all the financial institutions, once you are going for a renewal or you are coming up with any new application or a product to process customer information, you have to come to the Data Protection Commission to do something called a, a Data Protection Impact Assessment. We do this to us to measure the risk level of the application. How, what is the impact you are going to ha that application is going to have on the citizenry or the data subject. So we go through all those processes. We, you give us your risk assessment. We do your business continuity. You give us your business continuity plan and everything about that solution to know that, okay, if, even if there's a data breach, at what level, which is going to be indicated in the rich register, how, what is the impact that is going to have on that citizenry or the data subject. So we go through all those processes with them to make sure that every citizen in this country, personal information that is being captured by that solution is well safeguarded with all the security parameters and everything in that solution is well handled. Um, secondly, on our act, we also encourage organizations to train data, uh, data protection supervisors. They will act as mediators between the organization and we, the regulator. So in your office or wherever you find yourself, if you have any issue concerning data, you don't understand anything, maybe somebody, you know, there are instances sometimes you'll be there and you'll be receiving unsolicited text messages or um, you'll be there, someone will just call you, or send you an email or anything of that sort that you knowing that you've actually not given your information to someone. You can just first make a point contact to your data, super, uh, data protection supervisor in your organization, then 
from there they will get back to us the supervisor will then report to the regulator with the data protection commission to lodge the complaint they will do an investigation based on your compliance report because compliance report is something you do every two years that is upon your renewal of license so we'll take your compliance report go through it and see what are the indications or what are the parameters that you stated in to handle incidences of such then we'll take it from there Second, uh, for me not to take too much time, I'll be talking about the ethical guideline, which is the AI. And uh, since 2019 and before the COVID, data protection was working together with the United Nations Global Post and uh, through the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization. They give us the nod that is data protection to handle the development or the draft of the ethical guideline of artificial intelligence. And um, in fact, we, we are done with it. The draft is out and uh, we are waiting for the approval. So as uh, Doug was saying and uh, Alma was saying, the document is there, it's very, very critical. As you said, where we are as a nation, when we don't have this thing in place, uh, a lot of things are going to happen. Mm. And currently, there are solutions, especially this bank apps, uh, those who give these loans with this bank, uh, those who give these loans with this app. Sometimes you be there and somebody will send a photo to a group that this person has defaulted and all that. These are all called dark patterns in solutions that we regulators have to make sure these companies, uh, these tech companies don't do that. They will fish out those dark patterns. You might think, oh, you are doing nest, nest, nest. But at the end of the day, you are already giving them consent that when exactly. I default, pick up all the contacts from my phone and share it to people. Yeah. This is what is happening. So um, I also encourage us to also read, especially when we are downloading any solution or anything, we have to make sure that we read the privacy notice to make sure that, because you are signing a contract, mm -hmm. so you have to make sure that you are, you, are, you are confident about what you want to use. It's not just about the next next. So I think it's another thing we as individuals, we also have to take into uh, consideration. On the AI strategy too, it's also done, we did it together with the, GIZ, the Smart Africa, also helped us in developing that, which is also ready, and uh, we are still waiting for approval. So when this thing comes in place, I think it's going to help us as a nation and also regulate the tech companies, the startups, and the, the foreign ones also coming in. I think TikTok was in, in Ghana, like, I think they had a meeting yeah. in Ghana, yeah, this week. <laughs> so when these guidelines come in place, and I think it's also going to help them also know how they are going to help us or protect us. Because this AI is, we are to protect, uh, we are to regulate AI, not them regulating. Because at the end of the day, we feed them with the information, that is the data or the quality data. So it will be very, very bad for them, for the system to tell us what we have to do as human beings. So okay. I think it's another important thing we have to look at, that we are looking forward for this draft uh, um, document to be passed. And I think um, there will be a national sensitization and. Uh, We'll take it from there. Okay. Thank you. Bryce, I'll come to you, but let me just quickly go to um, Emmanuel. Still on the regulation aspect of it, I mean, the level at which we should regulate it. There was something that Ama said, that yes, we are talking about regulation, but it becomes very difficult when those out there uh, internationally put up their regulation, and Ghana would, would like to go different way from that kind of regulation. Yes, we can do something, but we also have to work with them. So how do we actually handle the regulation that benefits us, and of course, doesn't also allow us to go overboard? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I think I side with Prof uh, when he said, uh, don't overregulate. Okay, if you do that, you kill the technology instantly. Um, where we are as, as a country and as a continent, we've not gotten anywhere in this whole AI, you know, um, trend. We've not gotten anywhere? We've not gotten anywhere. As a, as a country and as a continent, mm. all right? Uh, if you look at the data in terms of where we are, in fact, when I'm looking at the percentage of, I mean, adoption in Ghana, I, I, it's difficult for me to make a lot of sense out of our percentage. Mm. You know, they combine us with Middle East, you know, together. So when you're looking for African percentage, you have to look at Middle East and Africa combined together before you can get a percentage of how we are adopting Adapted. the technology. And so, uh, even though we need to look at the principles behind how we can create these things, mm. uh, we should be careful not to kill it, 
All right, that's, that's the biggest advice, I think. I, I, I overheard the, the data protection saying they'll be doing national you know, consultation and making sure that every views are, are, are put on board. I, I mean, that, that would be great for us. You know, the education, our educational sector is there. They are into AI you know, uh, training mm. or education. How did they come in? Okay, uh, because we are, pro we are now producing AI students or AI graduates who would, would, would fit the market or who would serve the market. And so we shouldn't uh, think that, oh, this technology is dangerous and so therefore we should, you know, clamp down on, 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 on uh, adoption and, and all that. I, I think I overheard some uh, parliamentarians saying that this is dangerous, let's kill it before it kills us. I mean, <laughs> so uh, atomic bomb has been there over ages. Nuclear energy has been there, or nuclear bombs has been there over ages. But we are still living and people are producing it. And if you have been told not to produce it and you but there, uh, one day when the whole thing turned upside down, you will be wanting. And so we need to build capacity. We need to, we need to create, I mean, people who, who are innovators in the yeah. system. Yeah. We, need, we, need, we need to educate them. We need to have these skills all around, okay? And so it's key. Please, we all want to be involved in the crafting of the strategy and also of the principle. It's, it's good. I mean, all of our, you can see EU and the other countries that are well developed, China and the rest, yeah. they don't have a law, okay, that regulates the, 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 the technology. What they are having now is principles, okay? Principles of being responsible, be accountable, be fair, Okay, in your, in your uh, development and, and, and the usage of it. And he said it all. We don't read. That is one of the things that is killing us, right? We don't read. Most often, as developers, because we want to be indemnified, we want to make sure that we, we don't fall short of the law, we put everything that would, would take us away no from, from you know, those in the terms and conditions. So when we it's one of the responsibilities of the developers from uh, the regulators that especially data protection that when you are collecting somebody's data please inform him all right give him the opportunity to be aware that you are going to use the data for these specific purposes mm. and we do that we do that sometimes we say okay the data we are collecting we'll collect it for the purposes of this and that and that and when we are sending you messages, then you are angry. And then you said, oh, why are these people sending me all this stuff? Because you have agreed on the terms and conditions that we put in there. Because you don't read it. And so, and that's, that is a problem. Okay. So, um, and also, we made it very uneasy for, the, I mean, the users, to be able to read those terms and conditions. So it's deliberate. The, uh, uh, well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not deliberate because those are the terms that we got from the regulator that you must let the user know all this, okay. you know, before you collect the data. Mm. So we put all those things there. So it lies on the user to read, to read. and to know these are the things that uh, uh, will come after, after, after us signing up to okay. the system. And so, yes, AI is a different area, and so let's wait for a while, at least read some few paragraphs, okay? Because this technology is, is really, really, uh, I don't want to use the word scary, but it's, it's something we need to be careful about. Okay. Be sure of what the system you are, you are trying to use, because it can ravage through your device. If you don't know, and you, you go and install specific AI applications, yeah. it, can, it, can, it can expose you, yeah. all right? It can expose you. Because as you're online, what you're actually doing is you are replicating yourself, okay? Every day you are replicating, you are building your virtual self on the, on the internet. And that virtual self can sign your check. Yes, be rest assured, it can sign. AI can sign your check and take it to the bank. Bank can clear your, your, your payments. And so we need to be very careful 
uh, what we are signing up to, and uh, I, I believe that we'll, we, we can be safe. All right, but it's interesting to hear you say this, and again tell us that let's not overregulate it. It's, it's a bit scary though, but I'll come to you, man. Let me move to Bright here, at least from the consumer's point of view, well, the issues raised here, yes. Let's face it. Um... Governments, yes. governments will always play catch up, okay? So on the regulation space, it's always catching up with technology because of just the speed at which technologies emerge. And so in, in, in 2023, when ChatGPT came on, it set off a flurry of activity in the regulatory space. So one of the things that the EU did, they did a revised AI Act. And then it was like ban, right? Ban, any extreme, whatever. President Biden issued an executive order. What did he say? It's okay, this is it, but test. Test and be sure of the safety first. It's all the things that the data protection said they were doing with the banks and so on. It's the way to go, to mm. test for safety and build in the system that protection at, in, ahead. Another one that EU did was limited legal liability for the developers. Because mm. if you don't let them feel any sense of risk, they will take off and then do what they, want, they think they want to do. They will put in terms and conditions. And they know we don't read right we don't read the thing and we just want to install the app so why should i be reading all this long winding yeah, stuff yeah. so let's take off the terms and conditions and build in the thing that will protect the consumer mm. because they, they are the ones that will make you make more money to develop the next app but what if the terms and condition is ethically needed well yeah so what is ethics it starts from the developer mm. the ethics has to start from the developer right so one professor in Kellogg Management School did some work. He's actually a finance professor. He did some work, and I liked what he came out with, like finding a sweet spot with all these three I've identified, that if we make the developers work with um, the testing stage with mm. governments and whatever the regulator is, so you are, you are being tested to make sure it's sound. You, the developer, you are involved in making sure that even the regulatory framework, which is the legal dimension, you understand it, and you know where not to cross and so on. So eventually, you come out with something that has built in, and that's what you refer to that China is doing principles and so on. So they know that they're working with the developers to say, you can't cross, mm. you know, you have to test and see where the thing is taking us before we allow you. Um, so that you don't have the burden of regulation or bans coming through. Yeah. So I thought that's, that's an intervention I, I needed to make. Okay. Right. Um, still with you, right? Um, uh, one of my mobile service providers, I had challenges with my internet. And uh, I called whatever helpline I had to call. It wasn't going through. Uh, later, someone told me to go to them on WhatsApp. So there's a, a WhatsApp number WhatsApp that you bot. have to. Yeah. When I started chatting with whoever I was chatting with. It's a bot. <laughs> yes. I later realized that. This is not a human being yeah. because the person is not actually addressing the concerns that yeah. I'm experiencing. Yeah. So from institutions and companies, how can they actually use the AI for the benefit of consumers so that they can actually solve consumer problems and concerns when interacting with them? So I started off by saying that AI does achieve efficiencies. Mm. So in order to efficiently handle all these customers, we need to use the bot sometimes because you can't have just endless numbers of people picking up calls mm. as soon as you make the call, as soon as you, you, you type. So the AI is the first layer. It may answer some questions that are already programmed into it to answer. answer. Yeah. Then of course there must be a customer line that you can then go to when you find out that no, it's not really specific to your need. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be a combination. It's not either or. It's both humans and machines working together in order for you to be protected and be responsibly uh, handled mm. by the, 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 the service provider. Mm. So that's, for me, the way it has to be. We, we need to train a lot more people to work with the AI systems. We need the AI system because we need the efficiencies. The world is moving very fast. We can't continue to be slow and have low productivity. Inflation is climbing every time. Mm. So we need the AI working with human systems. OK, all right. Mary, you want to say something quick one, then I'll move to uh, audience here for some questions. I think um, it has to do with um, it has to do with the data protection. Yeah. 
So the submission I am making has to do with the data protection and for those of us who consume digital products and the information we give. Um, and it's quite intriguing to share an experience a couple of um, weeks ago because I had to open my service provider's helpline and I had purchased data and for, for a number of hours I I felt imprisoned. I wasn't able to make any calls because in as much as the deduction has been done, nothing has been given back. So a few interaction with the bot, um, eventually I had my kind to interact with. And um, I was requested to provide information that I thought were quite you know, sensitive. And the lady at the other side of the line said, well, until you provide them, there is nothing or little we can do. Data protection, um, sorry, Emmanuel was saying that, look, this, we are not there yet. This conversation, we are not there yet. But it doesn't prevent us from having that conversation. We just have to be forearmed because we are using the technology already. I don't know how many of us, this, um, um, the approval that the EU gave this week, Wednesday, on the AI guideline, Tuesday. I don't know how many of us have read it and really what the requirement, one of them I'm going to read is that the National um, Cyber Security Center, this law is expected to reshape how business and organizations in Europe, in Europe use AI. It imposes ban on some acceptable or, or unacceptable technologies it bans the use of AI to interpret the emotions of people. Yes, in schools and workplaces, and other types of automated profiling intended to predict a person's likelihood of committing crimes. So, you and I, what do we use AI for? It, it tells you that yes, we are not there, but we are using the technology. We must have the conversation. And from the perspective of the regulator, we are asking the question, what is the level of the consumer? And where is the consumer now? What does the consumer need? For a couple of years, the Cybersecurity Authority started commemorating the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. This is a global event. But we were celebrating it under the umbrella NAXAM, the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which we celebrate every October. And the objective is to ensure that as many entities as possible, government, private, business, children, are reached with cybersecurity education. Because the technology is with us, we can't fake ignorance and think that it's not something that we don't need because we are there, unfortunately. We possibly are operating it from the angle of ignorance, and that's where the danger is. Because as you go within the virtual space every day, just go on a particular application for a whole week. The following week when you go there, the application would ask you, is this what you need? You've already been predicted when you are not even thinking. So it's important for us to understand this current domain and cooperate with regulatory institutions. And where am I coming from? From where we sit as a cybersecurity authority, for instance, we are collaborating a lot with the Association of Bankers, with the uh, telecommunications, and with a number of uh, the industry within the country, because we know, we, we very much understand that from the incident response perspective, it's important that when a bank, when a health sector, when any critical infrastructure agency picks up a vulnerability, that is reported. But unfortunately, we don't have these reports coming because possibly, in a case, the banking industry may think that, look, if I report this, there is going to be panic redrawal. So they're not going to report it. The question is, if you don't report a vulnerability within your system, you're going to lose all right, but the cyberspace is borderless. 
so, the regulator is unable to investigate because he did not report it, and that is going to affect another bank. That is going to affect another sector. That is exactly where the cyber criminals are thriving because our critical infrastructure agencies mm. are not reporting incidents. Okay, all right. I will have to move to the audience here. Uh, quick, okay. quick, quick contribution. A quick one from Prof. Then yes. A quick one also from Mark. So Mark. let me put on my academic hat for just two minutes. Okay. Um, the conversation we've had so far is about us having Me Too regulations for technologies that are being developed elsewhere. We're talking about regulation, regulation. We've not talked about national strategy. What do we want to do when we grow up? What are the areas in AI that we should put our resources around so that we can create the same levels of jobs and opportunities for our teaming youth? So I think it is also important that instead of just trying to figure ways to regulate a space that we don't really know too much about, we should also have a national strategy. The Americans had a national strategy for AI more than 10 years ago. So regulate, but also provide resources to really develop the technology in the direction that will be advantageous for us. Because again, AI is for everybody. Everybody has to figure out when you go to that elephant, which part of the elephant is most important for you. Okay, all right, a quick one, Maxwell. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Prof, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll counter your this thing after the <laughs> panel discussion. So I, I wanted to share um, a quick note on the, um, the importance of actually taking data protection as a serious subject matter. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if we don't take data protection very serious, it will be difficult for us to handle the, handle the cyber side of it. Because um, what is the cyber, what are we protecting if we don't have our data protection mm. Um, guidelines in place, or we as individuals and our, uh, we being as data controllers or data processors. So I will encourage some of us as business owners uh, and CEOs, I think it's something we need to take it into much consideration so that it will minimize the risk of all these cyber issues we are issues talking about talking that about. people are not reading and all that. Because if you can't collect, I always say, if you can't protect, you don't collect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's pick uh, some questions from you. Uh, you just, uh, just raise your hand and then I'll get to you. Okay. You tell us your name and maybe who the question is directed to. Then we can move on. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Alfred Boyan. Uh, uh, panel. I heard something about neuroscience. You were mentioning about neuroscience. And you know, we know the neuroscientists have told us about our brain, how the brain receives nearly about 11 million messages a second, per second. And it's only 95% of them subconscious. Only 5% are very conscious. Now, Two questions. Customer, I just walk into the shop. I have this brain working. Per second, I'm receiving about 11 million messages. Seeing all those things. How is the A1, AI, going to help me make a conscious decision of purchasing? Then as a marketer, how is AI going to help me get to the 95% of the 11 million messages in my customer's brain to pick up uh, a sale? <laughs> Can I? Okay, let's, let's just speak another one then after okay. which, yeah. Kofiado <clears throat> from yes. the Ministry of Trade and Industry. I, I, I tend to go with Prof and the uh, uh, regulation, regulation, regulation. Because I sit down as a public servant, and then the private sector, and then all the, let me say, the businesses and the people in the domain of the AI are far ahead. As a regulator, I don't even have the understanding. So how do I regulate something that I do not have the understanding? So for us, we have a domain. And I, 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 the reason why I tend to go with Prof, 
we know our current situation. And that is where we need to work. So in regulation base, we can make it short term. This is where we want to go. Medium term. So that by that medium term, we now understand the domain. Look at what is happening only yesterday and two days ago between US and China on TikTok. Yeah. Because America is aware that most of the users, their information is with somebody that they don't trust. And that is where the discussion is. We are in the domain, but we don't know where it is going. So how do we protect ourselves? Okay, thank you very much. So we can start with uh, Mr. Bonyan's own first. Yes. Uh, the neuroscience the, the question. question about how the AI will be able to keep all these products that you are trying to select and also make recommendations or make marketing uh, decision to consumer. Um, I want to start from the point that AI, we have types of AI, okay? There's what we call weak AI. There's what we call general AI that behaves like us. Then there's another one we call super AI, which think beyond human being. <laughs> so if that is the case, then retention, I mean, keeping stuff, uh, reproducing those memories is easy. And mind you that this is not like humans, okay? Humans, we tend to forget almost majority of the things that we've learned or we've seen. But in this scenario, because we, I mean, the storage is there, which keeps all the things that has been captured, it can, goes back, can go back to the memory and pick whatever has been uh, captured mm. and make sense out of it. So it is easy. I mean, we are going now to wearables, all right? So you, your watch can be AI powered. So where's your walk? I'm sorry, not watch, your spectacle can be AI powered. Whereas you walk around, it picks everybody here. It can tell you how many female and male in this room. Yeah. Seconds, in microseconds, it can tell you that. It can tell you who is who, who is the managing director of which, whichever company, yeah. by just wearing the glass yeah. and you know, walking through us here. So that is, how, that is the level of intelligence we are talking about. That is the level of intelligence we are, we are, we are talking about here, right. Let me add to that. So I think at the beginning of this conversation, we said we are just looking at the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. We are getting to the point where we are talking about quantum computation underlining AI. Those will be at the dangerous levels, but <laughs> let me make a funny comment. There was a very famous guy in the Midwest, in the US, called Elder Beerman, and he started making shoes, selling shoes. And he was asked one time when I was an undergrad in an interview how he made money selling shoes. And he said 95% of the time, the customers that walks into the shop did not know what they were looking for. So what he would do, he would just meet you at the door and say, come over, I have something you will like. And he brings four shoes and he's forcing them under your feet. And he invented the, the little box in the shoe store with the mirrors on all the four corners. And he said, it looks nice, doesn't it? And he said, customers buy out of guilt. That's how he made his money. Hmm. So I don't think that you walk in there and 95% of the time, you know exactly what you're looking for. That is why we have window shopping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Let's... Let me speak on yes, yes. regulation and hmm. how appropriate the regulations you know, are. Um, I think from the cybersecurity perspective, we know where we are, and that's an assurance. And we know what we are doing. The conversation we are having now, the AI conversation, mm. is at the superstructure level. At the national level, we are the base level of this digital development. That's where we are. And the regulatory agency, the cybersecurity authority, is looking at establishing the basic structures that will serve as a fundamental structure for the main structure that we are building or for the main conversation that we are having now. Mm. If we look at our cybersecurity regulation, for instance, that which looks at 
the cybersecurity service providers, the cybersecurity establishment, the cybersecurity professionals in the country. And the fact that these service providers and entities would have to be registered, accredited, and, and licensed is quite key. Cybersecurity operations are such that these are very intrusive operations. And of course, Emmanuel can tell you that. If you invite a cybersecurity professional into your agency that, look, we have this problem, come and do pen testing, come and do this kind of analysis, you'll be shocked the volume and quantum of information the professional will be leaving your outfit with without your slightest idea or knowledge. Yeah. You will be shocked. Now imagine an entire ministry, or let's say even the presidency, there is a cyber attack or a cyber issue there, and a professional is invited to fix the problem, and that professional has not been accredited, you ask, what kind of information is the person taking? It's true. Where is the person taking this information? Is the person or the professional even a spy? We have no idea. Mm. So this is a conversation that we must have, and that's exactly what we are doing. It's at the base of the structure. We must have it. Other than that, we will be overwhelmed with whatever AI is bringing. We tackle AI and then we realize, okay, but what are the legislations? And then the answer is we don't have. So how did you get here? So that's exactly what we are doing. And that is why from 2023, mm -hmm. when we began this conversation up until now, at the moment, the cybersecurity service providers in the country that have so far registered and are in the process of, of um, uh, receiving accreditation and licensing with the Cybersecurity Authority. These are all going into the processes. We have 1,189. These understand that the regulation is important. For cybersecurity establishment, so far 54 of them have been given provisional license. And then we have 196 of the cybersecurity professionals who also have understanding of what the cybersecurity authority is doing and are also in the process of working on their documentations with us. So yes, the base is important. We are not jumping the gun. It's important that we have this conversation, but it's also quite key that when citizens understand these vulnerabilities, it's, 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 no, it's no privacy, it's a national, you know, it's a national security issue that the conversation we must have. So it's not a particular you know, bank that is suffering a vulnerability, and so you should not report it, and, and you know, people will do panic redrawal. But let's, let's have a national perspective. Let's have okay. a global perspective in this entire conversation. OK, let's speak um, some other questions. One second. One second uh, OK. Look, I think regulation is fine. Okay. One of the challenges I have seen is enforcement. Enforcement. I mean, we all know today that people have their SIM card registered against their Ghana cards. And yet, when you accidentally send money to somebody, even the, uh, the telcos are not able to help you retrieve your money. Yet, they have all the records. They know exactly who withdrew the money and when because they have a password. So, and, and it's, 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 it's beyond the telcos. I mean, you go to East Legon today and you have buildings with injunctions on them, but they are still being built. Okay? Now, if you just go back into history, there was a guy called Meredith who was prevented by racists from going to University of Mississippi, uh, University of Mississippi. But when the court said that school had to desegregate, FBI took him to school every single day until he graduated. Here you go to court, they issue a warrant, and nothing happens. You go to court, you get an injunction, and nothing happens. Okay. And so you can have all the regulations, but if it is not punitive enough, it's nothing but just a Me Too regulation copied from the European Union. Okay. Um, Clarice, let's, let's pick. We are live on Join News, actually, so we'll quickly have to uh, get enough questions and enough answers before we wrap up at 10. So let's do this snappy. Yes, please. Good morning to everyone. My name is Joyce. Um, 
I'm enjoying the discussion, but the question I want to ask, how are consumers being protected here? And that is the fundamental. We need not to seek our interest of my profession or my career, but we are seeking the interest of the consumer. The absence of the consumer, your profession is nothing, or your business is zero. So what are we doing? Um, data protection. I have been to so many institutions, and when you get to the front desk, you find a notebook. They ask you to write your name, your phone number, where you're coming, exactly. I, I'll make this confession here that once I was looking for a particular person, when I got there, I saw the person's name, the phone number. Why wouldn't I pick the phone number and the email and contact the person directly? Is that consumer protected? No. But we see all these things in most of our institutions. And you find out whether data protection is indeed, or we are complying with data protection laws. Okay. I'll move on to um, um, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. He was talking about they put a lot of contract conditions, blah, blah. And, but let's look at the legality of it. Is it constitutional to the innocent customer? The fact that the person is able to read and write, that does it, is, that, is that all? How is the consumer protected in that? Let's look at the legalities around it. You cannot put a whole text in a very compressed form, in a font that the customer is unable to read, and, you are, and under a short time, you're expecting the customer to read to understand and agree to it before he moves on to the next stage. That is unconscionability, I guess. When we come to regulatory, yes, we need to regulate the space. No doubt about that. But again, what are we putting, what, are the, what is the framework? Is the customer the, our preference or it is the nation that we are considering first? Okay. These are my questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's one here. Thank you very much and good okay. morning everybody. This has been very educative and informative and I'm glad I, I made it. Are we at a point uh, with AI where we can catalog all the uses to which the various uh, identifiable businesses can put AI to? Pharmaceuticals, hotels, uh, transport and all that. That's the first part. And the second point is, so a hotelier gets convinced about uh, AI in his business. Where does he go to? Who does he consult? to provide that guidelines in using the AI. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, yeah. Maxwell, or maybe yeah, Maxwell starts yeah. with you, so, the data collection. Thank you very much. Yes. To answer to your question concerning the notebooks always in front of uh, security posts and receptions of organizations. Um, as a data subject, or me myself, most of the time, if I go to even a hotel or anywhere, you tell me to give you my name, where I'm coming from, my phone number, and I'm not comfortable, I'll ask the person, why do you need it for? That's the first question. Because if I'm to come to an office, and you, the first question may be on the phone, I should give you my house address, where I stay, or probably my marital status, then there should be a question. You are collecting too much information. So if you're not comfortable, you, can, you have the right to ask the person why you need to produce all those information. I'm not saying what is there is right, but organizations also have their own internal controls for emergency purposes. It's not that they are collecting it unless you've suffered an abuse. As you said, that you knew someone during, uh, somebody you, were, you, you, you knew, you saw the person's name in the book. Fine, but the organization itself also need that log. Because if, to say there's a, there's a disaster, and the building comes down. I know it's a notebook, it can get missing, but other organizations are using electronic means of now capturing this information. They should be able to know the number of persons that entered the building within that space of time. So 
Um, I think it has its own, um, is, 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 it has its own merit and demerit. But I think what I would say is, if you go to any organization, you go to someone, they give you a form to fill. If you are not comfortable with the questions they are asking you, you have the right to ask. And then I think that will bring, minimize your risk. If they give you a legitimate reason for that, it's fine. So I think I wouldn't say much to that. <laughs> you are not, I know you are not, you don't understand. <laughs> No, that is what I'm saying. The form. I don't. Most of it, me. Yes. Because you are asking me of too many questions. Are you a Mrs. or a Mr. Are you this and that and all of that? In addition, I add my telephone number, and I said no, I'm not comfortable. Then they will turn you away. They will tell you, then I'm sorry. That's their policy here. You can't meet the man. And you have to go back. So, and probably it's urgent I meet you. And that, especially for people coming to look for people for the first time they don't know. You, you, you unconsciously provide all these details and it's become a norm. So I understand where you are coming from. So from, you can say from I'm the not customer point so of view. But what away. I'm saying is um, you as an individual, you have the right. We have something called the data subject right. You have the right to object to anything. Whether to put your name or not to put your name. But her concern, but her concern, her concern is, is her objection will end up not allowing her to see exactly, the person she yes, because, exactly. yes, so that is what I'm saying. The organization itself, yeah. fine, so now, is an internal, depending on, I yes. said that depending on the information you, they are asking you. Mm. If you ask me for my marriage, then I have to work out. Because depending, I'm coming to just uh, maybe to buy a fridge from one of these shops, and you're asking me for my stuff. Then probably it's as much I as see, good, good, Maxwell, good to go. I'm coming to data protection. I have a new company. I want to register with you. I've been asked certain questions I think I'm uncomfortable with. I need to register with you because that's what the law demands. I can't just walk away. What do I do? So for data protection, as a don't want That's easy, an easy. example I'm actually giving, though. So that's where her question is actually coming from. Okay, maybe. Because she actually needs to see someone. There's a need there. She's accessing information. She thinks it's uncomfortable. And yet, if she doesn't provide that information, she can't see the person she needs to see. That's where the question is. So, so, so let me... Okay. Yes. Look, let me just... Yeah, it's okay. The, the consumer is in trouble. <laughs> That is the bottom line. Okay. And the consumer is going to be in trouble for a very long time. Right. And that comes to my point that once you start adapting other people's regulations, you need to be careful because there's a context to it. So today, when you walk through an airport, somebody is measuring your body temperature. They are scanning you in 3D to see the red spot, whether you are panicky. And so when they pick you from the line to search you further, it just didn't happen randomly. So when they tell you we just, it's a random search, it's not true. They've collected some variables from you as you're walking. So in that context in, the, in, in the Europe or in the US, that data is not available to anybody except the security agency. So there's a certain level of protection there. But the consumer is still in trouble for a long time to come. Because if you don't sign in to come into my office, you will not get in. Where that data goes, even me, I don't know. It's in some notebook. I don't know what is going to happen to that notebook when I hit the jackpot and I'm gone. So I think we need to contextualize data protection here. Not the Europeans, because they have mechanisms to protect. And even they still get breached. Okay. I think, well, I am representing my Director General, Dr. Albert Nchibu Isiaku. <laughs> and uh, any time it, we talk about Ghana's digital conversation and issues of cybersecurity development, he's got a phrase. He says, we are cooking. It's not cooked yet. And what does that mean? The kind of decision we are taking is premised on science. Mm. But we are not there yet. Recently, I needed um, information, the contact of um, a minister of state. And I knew that my front office was the best place to get it. And I had to follow a rigorous procedure. 
Now it gets to the front office lead and she says, why do you seek this contact? And I explain in an email and the response that comes is, I'm sorry we can't give it. And I didn't get it. The same institution you The were same getting. institution, I didn't get it. I'm talking about the Cybersecurity Authority. Mm. I didn't get it. So we are talking about the institution that even before you get a contact, you should establish a justification for that. And if it is not in the interest of the institution, where a top management person has signed for the request, you're not going to get it. Mm. How is a consumer protected from your angle, ma'am? The cybersecurity authority usually, the computer emergency response team, when a vulnerability or a criminal activity is picked up, the first thing we do, before, that is after engagement with the immediate stakeholder, I think for those of you who have been following us a lot, we issue an alert. It's a national alert to let you know that there's vulnerabilities in the system. This is how they are working. This is what you can do to secure your asset. We do that. And then on a daily basis, we also send out advisories of how best to stay digitally hygiene. And then we also have the computer emergency response team also has the point of contact that if you are suspicious of any cybersecurity activities, within your systems, this is the number to call or to send a message to, 292. That's our point of contact. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. I have less than 15 minutes to actually wrap up. So okay. briefly, and I will just speak yeah, about one or two questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so the question about whether consumer is protected. <laughs> yeah, so I work with IDEC Digital. Right, IDEC Digital is a software development company. Uh, aside that, we have uh, IDEC AI Center of Excellence. IDEC AI Center of Excellence is into research and into skill development in AI space. And we also develop some AI tools as well. Um, so, what we are producing or we are developing, are the consumers protected? I mean, that, that's the question coming. Yes, how do you protect? Consumers, how do you ensure the protection of consumers in development of AI products? Mm. Now, one key thing you do is to collaborate, right? Collaboration is key because if you are doing that, it means that the the members, okay, or the the partners will come together to monitor what you are producing. And so, we have some collaborations with. Uh, Academic City University College. Uh, we also have a collaboration with uh, IIPGH, that's uh, Institute of ICT Professionals, Ghana, and also with uh, 7W Artificial Intelligence Company in Slovenia. So you can see that we don't work in vacuum. Uh, everybody is working and monitoring each other, making sure that uh, whatever we are doing or producing uh, meets you know, consumers' uh, expectation. So yes, you are protected. Uh, why do we make terms and conditions so long that consumers find it difficult to read all this? How many minutes would you go through that? I myself, I'm also a consumer. <laughs> Even though I said that we put all these things there, I'm also a consumer and I have to take some time to read through some of the things. Yeah, because let, I me, know let me briefly cut you in here. Uh, we'll be going off uh, join news at 10. So those of us, so those watching us on television, you can just quickly go online on the CIMG page and you can get us live there. But we'll continue, but we're going off on uh, 10 o'clock on uh, Join News. But subsequently, we are live on, on online, the CIMG page too. Okay. 